Welcome to Innovating Music, a podcast from the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Gigi Johnson. are opening the doors wider for the next year of podcasts and taking a look at futures in music, both the systems that are changing or need to change, but also how this stuff is impacting live performance and community locally and globally. Please join us by subscribing on your favorite podcasting service and sharing this with your friends and colleagues. So let's get to the next podcast topic. Vicki Nauman of Cross Border Works joined us at UCLA, along with Andrea Young from Coral Young, and we talked about Music 3.0, which was a recent article in Rethink Music that Vicki had done to talk about how if Music 1.0 was physical recorded music, and if 2.0 was digital, we're at a 3.0 that is doing something really different with streaming and what's happening with the changes and all the systems around streaming, that 2.0 really bent the old systems, the physical recorded goods systems, to try to make it work with downloads. And instead, we're reinventing most of the space. So we had fun mostly starting to talk with Vicky and then joining in with Andrea joining us toward the end of the podcast. Vicky, you had this really great article in Rethink Music can you talk a bit about what music 3.0 is and why you're speaking from that point of view? Absolutely. I presented a concept, which is really looking at the ecosystem of music up at maybe a 5,000 foot level. I see the music industry 1.0 as having been constructed around radio and the sale of physical goods, CDs primarily. All of the supply chain, the rights, the rights management, royalties, labels, publishers, PROs, radio stations, they're all architected around this 1.0. When Napster came around in 1999, and I was there working in some of the earliest services, the industry was bent into what I would call 2.0, which was digital. And we used the same supply chain, the same labels, the same publishers, the same systems, rights and royalties for 2.0, even though it really didn't marry up with the technologies, the use cases, the amounts of royalties. And this has been stretched, and we've seen a lot of problems in the rights space and problems getting licensing and lawsuits and all sorts of nasty, ugly things that have occurred. But in many ways, it also matches up with people who are calling it like the read-write web, that the fact that there was the concept that somebody else could create outside of the normal pipeline. So they were still trying to jam that into the new pipeline, too. So people who are attempting to be new artists still were having to go through the distribution pipeline and the radio pipeline and everything else. They just could now create on their side of the table and put things up on the digital web in theory directly to people, but... Not necessarily. But not necessarily, exactly. As a part of this 2.0 industry, there's been a prediction for many years that the labels would be completely obsolete and publishers would go away and there would be no middle layer of gatekeepers around the industry. And that's really been proven false because they still have a role and the smartest ones are evolving. But what's happening in the 3.0 industry is that the shift between artists saying, I'm going to create something and then I want to get signed and I want to have the label buy out my rights, give me an advance, and then I get a bundled pack of services to build my career. What's happened is there's there have always been more hobbyist musicians who CD Baby and other platforms, they release music and they retain all their rights. But There's not really much of a commercial element around that. But what's happening now in 3.0 is that there's artists of significant size and stature in the industry that are exiting their major label deals. Maybe they are keeping their, you know, some of their recordings under major labels, but they're carving out the ability to do some things on their own. And it's more than just retaining their rights. It's about 
driving their own destiny. How do they want to create? What kind of music do they want to create? They don't necessarily want a label or an A&R team to tell them, you know, it's got to be a little bit more pop. It's got to be a little bit more this, a little bit more that. But they're freeing themselves up to create the way they want to hire teams that they want that can help them with their promotion and brand engagements and experiential marketing. And they're retaining 100% of their rights. So they then are licensing into the DSPs directly. But what's happened in this 3.0, it's, it's not as simple as just retaining your sound recording or publishing rights. It's really causing an entire shift in the industry because Along with the retention of rights, that also means that you usually don't take an advance from the label. So you're needing to find a way to either self-finance or change the economics of what it means to be creating. Absolutely. And how do you pay your team? Mm -hmm. Because it used to be that an artist would sign with a label and they'd get an advance. And then their manager, that's how their managers were paid out of that advance. That's how their marketing and all of the other things that went into touring and new releases, all of that came out of an advance. And once that advance goes away, not only do you need to find a way to self finance your production and going into the studio, but you also need to pay your manager and you need to be able to have money to pay for artists or label services and distribution. And and so it, it upheaves a lot of things throughout that value chain between the artist and the DSP. So we had previously, and we still do in many cases, and in, in, if you look at the numbers still, in most cases, the label as bank so what is finance 3.0? What is the economics of, yes, I would like to be my own captain of my own fate, my own ship, but then who's paying for the bleeping ship? I mean, what is the, I know that I've run into companies that are trying to do sort of finance 3.0 and being the new bank. What are you seeing and where, how are people financing this new world order? I, there's a lot of activity in this space. I see money coming from multiple sources right now. There are finance companies of all sorts of shapes and sizes. I'm working with one of them where you're bringing money from the outside into the industry under specific terms. So it could be an advance against royalties. It could be a small fee that is associated with trading or selling partial ownership of your rights. There's also startups that are that are coming up with different ideas around bringing a, you know pooled investment in and being able to provide technology tools and services as well as some financing for artists to go into the studio. And then a few days ago we saw the announcement that Spotify is also advancing some money to managers and artists who are unsigned who want to sign directly to Spotify. And I think that Apple and Google and there's a lot of this going on under under the hood all over the industry that is just basically funneling money directly into artists that are trying to drive their own destiny. Well, now we have the data to show almost same day what's then effective on it. So you're able to actually have metrics that can actually drive investors to feel happy or not happy. It's almost like an immediate ROI metric on something that those a long-term build. So how are how's the data? Do you see, I know that you're, you're working with an organization in this space, but how does the data feed then this investment 3.0 model? The data is essential. I actually don't think that any of this would be happening. I don't think any of the finance companies would even be at the table without data. I don't think Spotify would be at the table without data. Because with streaming, we have now enough critical mass in the streaming marketplace all over the world that there's a predictability to your income. And there's a predictability to your releases and what kinds of patterns. I think we're just starting to see more analytics going deep into, you know, does it matter what, you know, should you release music around the time of a tour or not? Or should you release one song and then an entire album? I think a lot, there's a lot left to be done in that space. But what all of these companies are doing is they're looking at past statements of usage and trends and royalty payouts through all of the different mechanisms. And then, 
you know, it's a spreadsheet business of looking at the looking at the data and then figuring out on a on a forward looking view how much traffic will and royalties will you likely make in the next year to three years and bringing that money forward to the artists so that they can access the money at the beginning of that royalty stream rather than piecemeal throughout the course of one to three years. It's interesting. So at Music Biz in in May, um, several different people are asked, so if you're a student coming out of school right now, what do you really need to know as a skill? And Excel was mentioned over and over again as being able to actually use Excel. And I tend to think that unless you're in a music business program, you don't necessarily walk out of school nowadays knowing Excel and thinking about how to maneuver all those numbers. So it's a it's an interesting question with all of this. Exactly. I think the other trend that that's happening on the finance side is that because of the because of the way our economy is is working right now good or bad we have a lot of money on one hit, on one end of society and the people that are sitting on money are looking for ways to invest the into things that are not necessarily pegged to nasdaq in the market and so you have these uncorrelated investments in music where streaming trends and what people are paying for and what people are listening to, that's going to happen regardless of what happens on Wall Street. And so from an investment standpoint, it's really smart to be able to have an outlet to put your money into something that's, of course, uncorrelated to that marketplace. It diversifies your your investment mix. And of course, it's sexy. And people love the idea of saying, oh, yes, I, you know, I put money in or I bought the royalties of. There's a, a need for this on the finance side in terms of diversifying portfolios. And it's sexy. Yes. Yes. It's the new yacht. I'm investing in tech is the new yacht. That's and this why. is actually, I'm investing in sexy tech as right. I'm investing in the sexy part of this. Interesting. So I, I know that, if I remember correctly, in the interesting article that she wrote, you also were talking about the non-track uh, media that's coming through some of this stuff. Can you talk about that a bit, beyond just the single, the multimedia part of the artist now? Yeah, well, I think, you know, as a part of the 1.0 being bent to 2.0. I like to talk about music in containers, that we've had these containers of three minute singles and 12 to 14 song albums. Now, the only reason that these are norms is because radio required a three minute single. And it's actually, the size of the 45 also kind of dealt with it as well. Exactly. Yes. It, so it goes, the containers go back further. It, there's really no reason for us to continue to see the containers of today in the three minute single and the 12 minute or the 12 song album. But because we relied on all the distribution channels and all the business models and all the systems from 1.0 to bend them to 2.0, that's how that's what we have. But when you when you step away from that and you say, okay, I'm an artist and I no longer am beholden to delivering three albums of the pop, you know, top 40 nature to my major label, I'm going to do whatever I want. That opens up everything. And so what what is a new release? Is it is it a visual album? Is it a mix? Is it a 20 minute, you know, mixtape? Is it VR? There's really a, a future that we can't quite even foresee. But the containers of of yesterday kind of go away in this world. And in order to get into the big DSPs, Yes, the singles and the album and the collection, meaning a mixtape or some sort of playlist or album, still need to do that because that's what users expect of Spotify and Apple Music and Google Play and everything else. Where I think it gets really exciting is to think about the smaller experiences and the more innovative, immersive experiences that can be built on top of that. That if an artist is driving their own destiny and they want to create a an immersive sound experience or a VR uh, video as a new release, they can. Though I would say on the flip side, if you're only getting paid on, a, you're getting you're getting credit for a Spotify play after 30 seconds, 
it's affecting the creative experience in that first 30 seconds pretty remarkably as well, where artists are now figuring they have to make it so you won't click away because then they don't get the credit for the listen. I know. It's really crazy. I, I was actually meeting with someone from Universal Music in the brands group, and we were laughing about this at South By and saying, what if we looked at the top 500 songs of all time? How many of those would pass that criteria? You're still wandering in the dust in the first 30 seconds. In exactly. The tracks. Exactly. You have no idea what it's going to be, but our short attention span world right now, which is, I think the the attention span is now six seconds <laughs> online. The fact that people are creating and, and modifying their art in order to figure out how to retain people for at least 30 seconds so that they can get a fraction of a penny of a royalty, it feels to me like there's something really wrong in there, but it is the reality of the way the economics work. So I, I guess I can't cast too harsh of a judgment. And it's not just on music and books for Amazon Unlimited that you get paid by page now. It wasn't actually they had to make a change because they decided you're going to get paid by page, not by book that you then downloaded. And so there's one young man who figured out how to have a something, I don't know, I've got the numbers wrong, but like a thousand page book he put up, but made it so that you would click through all the pages and then managed to put up a bunch of those. And so suddenly Amazon owed him a bunch of money for people who didn't read the books, but had this whole thing about clicking through all the pages. So sometimes the system creates these bizarre artificial artifacts of what then is the creative piece underneath. But now, I mean, to fit in the DSPs, you're having to fit in the buckets, but you now can do other things in other platforms that are multimedia, that are interesting images and visuals. And on the flip side, you're having a lot of interesting things happening in live experiences where they're going into whether it's you two having the augmented reality experience recently and people are using different things to also amplify out what's happening in a live experience too. So it's it's an interesting time to be an artist because figuring out which of these things actually is going to be for love, joy, and the art versus making you money and that your fans actually want to see um, I mean, I talk to a lot of artists and a lot of tech who are pitching each other all the time. Hey, try this new blah, blah, blah. And, you know, what part of that 3.0 is then trackable and understandable and engageable and investable is sort of an interesting time right now. Well, it is. And I think that I, I also don't think that immersive experiences in VR and things that I would put into a category that are probably a little bit more high value, you know, where they're one off and they may be more immersive and they may be more engaging with the consumer. That's probably not going to be right for every single artist. I mean, some artists just want to go in the studio and make a recording and, and, you know, not, not bother with that and do a traditional label deal. I do feel like when we look at the, when we look at the horizon of all the different technologies and platforms and capabilities that are out there, we do need some some creators to step up to that and say, you know, these three are interesting to me. And I want to I want to lean in and figure out an experience that my fans might like. But what does success mean in that? You know, does it is it about something going viral? Is it about getting paid? Is it about having engagement? I don't think we really know how to measure success or um, or value in some of these completely unpaved technologies. But I'm definitely betting that the artists are going to be much more quick to figure out a great creative outlet in some of these technologies than a corporation that's sitting on millions of copyrights. So you have your own business that works with both tech companies and other creative companies. What are you doing that's exciting in this Music 3.0 space? Well, one of the things that I'm doing right now is I'm really trying to wrap my head around what is out there. Because one of the problems that I'm seeing is that we have we have companies that are in the distribution chain. And there, there are artists that are self-releasing. And so there are new distribution companies that are popping up. 
they're all in the business of delivering sound recordings to the DSPs and then getting in the money flow and in the data flow from the DSPs back to the artists. And DSP is digital service provider, shorthand for Amazon and Spotify and the the actual hundreds of entities, but we tend to be thinking about four of them, maybe. Yes, exactly. There are hundreds. Um but there's a lot of new distribution companies that are popping up. So we've got fragmentation at that level. We also have, in the world of, of self-released artists, it mirrors in probably even a more extreme way the same dynamic that we've seen in the big platforms, which is there's a 1% and then a cliff that falls off, and then there's lots and lots of people in the long tail. And so... In the world where you're trying to be a lean and mean new distribution platform for artists that are retaining their own rights, what is your business model? There's always the access to venture capital funding, but is it, you know, if you're going to try to take 5% or 10% or 15% of someone's royalties coming in, if there's no royalties, then is that viable? So I think just sustainability around this 3.0 of what what does that really look like from a distribution standpoint. And then the other piece of it that I'm really interested in is in the world of traditional label deals, you would, as an artist, you would have access to a bundle of services from that label, radio promotion, playlist placement, social media, you know, new release marketing, all of these kinds of things. And we could sit here all day and argue whether those things worked or they didn't work. But right now what's happening is those once you once you no longer sign with a label and get that package of goods, then the burden of that either goes to hi- you hiring the label for artist and label services or that burden going to a management company or there's a whole new crop of companies that are coming up that are they're not quite labels, they're not quite distribution companies, they're not quite tech platforms, but they're a little bit of all of that, where maybe they're a place for you to house and manage your metadata, get access to some great tools, and then it's about artist development and marketing and touring. they're, They're like being farm clubs? I mean, I tend to always say, as many other people do, if it's a free service, you're the product. And uh, more and more I'm running into, oh, we'll distribute your music for free. Well, no, they're using it as a farm club to then be able to filter off people. People go, oh, well, I don't have to pay the $50 or whatever to CD Baby. And I'm kind of going, $50 isn't much. And then you actually get your information and data. So what is the model? I I work with all these 20-year-olds. And, you know, they're they're believing, the, oh, wow, and we can really help. You know, so how do you kind of BS detect under the hood of some of these new services? Yeah, well, I think a lot of it is, you know, most of them think of themselves as tech companies that have a Venn diagram that overlaps into music. So for a lot of them, it's about getting real use cases and getting people using the platform and, and attracting artists who are a good fit for them. I think that one of the one of the essential pieces to any any of these companies success is going to be you know are all the interests aligned so that if the artist succeeds that everyone participates in it and everyone benefits from that and then what does that really mean and i think increasingly i'm seeing that the streaming royalties that come in from the the streaming services the dsps are a little bit more like what we would think of as radio royalties where they're a baseline and they're an important source of metrics of getting users to be familiar with the music but it's the new revenue streams that these small teams are starting to develop whether it's you know a a brand endorsement with a wine company or you know, listening parties or at well, That doesn't homes. help the poor songwriter, though, who's getting a tiny portion now of the streaming revenue. And is the, you know, the, the terrestrial radio actually still is a big chunk of how they... I mean, I, I just find that an interesting thing with the 3.0. The songwriter seems to be standing in the wrong spot in this transition. That's a really good point. I mean, especially when you think about the non-performing songwriter. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you know, people who are just performers, then you have people who are singer, songwriter, performer, composer, and then you have people that are just composers. 
And that's that's a hard position to be in in all of this because it's you know it's it's reliant upon making sure that when that composition is brought to life in a sound recording that you have everything intact to be able to collect your fair share of what you contributed to it. But it doesn't necessarily mean that in you know in some of the more high value immersive experiences that they're going to get the same fair share. How is this impacting the local experience and how, what are you seeing in the 3.0 in the global experience? Well, I think on the local side, I do feel like we've kind of lost sight a little bit of the importance of local communities in the digital world, you know, that everything is about having access to everything online, but you don't know what's happening down the street. And I do still feel like local scenes and the communities that can create the next big, the big movement or the next big sound, you know, you think about like grime coming out of the UK and that that was just, that was really, really localized in particular neighborhoods. That's a really key part of music. So I think on a hyper local level, I'm hoping that some of these, some of the hubs that are popping up in Nashville and LA and, you know, Omaha and Minneapolis, that these are people that are really going to work their local communities, their local artists and their local communities. But I think on a global level and the complete opposite range is that the DSPs are all global. You know, they're opening up an artist to audiences all over the world and who is going to then leverage that it's probably going to be management teams and artists that can figure out should they be doing a brand endorsement in Beijing or planning a tour in India that is going to come through exposure through all these global platforms you know there's a combination of economies of scale and economies of data and understanding the trends that are happening on the big global platforms, but then being able to translate that down to um, an artist in a local community and how do you build a career around this blend of passion and data and connections all over the world. It's going to require teams that can think along those lines, which is very different than the what we think of as a manager of the past. And it's a different set of school groups that we've had a company on here before, Outdustry, who actually brings, they, they hire people who are going back then to China who have gone to school here, who are thinking in a different way to go back and picking them up out of music industry programs in the U.S. so that they're able to think music 3.0, but go back into music 1.0 or 2.0 environment. So Exactly, exactly. And I think that we're seeing a little bit of the cross-pollinization between tech and music now where we've had, there's a handful of people that have, you know, came up through the labels and they've gone to tech companies and then there are companies that, there are people that are at that are that have been immersed in the tech and startup world, and they're going back to the label world. And I'm definitely in support of that because I feel like a lot of there's just a lot of lost in translation between tech companies and music companies, and they need to understand how the other the other side of the negotiating table thinks. You add then the U.S. China or India and all the different cultural differences and cultural practices. And it does require a certain mindset to be able to put all of these really complex pieces together and make them work. So Andrea has also been joining us here and uh, see if we can maybe share the microphone a little bit um, and maybe sort of think about what what then in working with emerging and mid-sized artists, do you see the Music 3.0 type of activity happening or are you seeing a different world for them and them seeing what they're up to or what are your thoughts on it? I think definitely musicians are supporting 3.0 world because it's a matter of, as you said, giving them control. They have the control. They're making the decisions. Do I want to release an LP? Do an album? Do I want to release a track every six weeks? What What is important to me? Is it a video? Is it touring? So they've got this whole arena to choose from to create which is way different than it used to be so definitely seeing that it comes with lots of challenges though because there isn't a proven path 
It's not like, in, I think it used to be under 1.0 and 2.0, okay, you do this, you get signed with a label, you get your advances, and then you're, and even then it wasn't always successful. But now it's just so much more wide open, and we don't know yet what's going to happen next. It's almost like we need case studies, and I've been actually talking with various people so that artists can see other artists' stuff, because you can see under the hood now in this 3.0-ish world, but you don't necessarily know what the hood looks like. And you, you know, in some ways, I mean, I deal with small artists a lot here with stuff we do at the school. And there have somebody coming to, I will say the word con them, but con them into, oh, you should work with me because, and they have no idea of how to make the decision because they can't really see into what ar- they can, but they don't take the time and energy to see what other artists are doing. You know, I think in working with artists, in the, for the past two years, I definitely see now, I feel like we have a lot more knowledge because the, the metrics are more available. It's more transparent to say, oh, wait, you're starting at this point with less than a thousand listens. Okay. A, a three month campaign isn't going to do what you want it to do possibly. I mean, yes, sure. A, an editorial curator can walk in the room of a venue and find you and you can have millions of spins. But really, it's a build, and it's going to be more of a career path. So then where do you invest your money? This is what we can do, but where are you going to go with it? Exactly, and I think that the um, the the other big unknown to me is when you're when you're starting out, you have a set of needs that when you have a thousand listens, you have a certain kind of knowledge and a certain, you know, need in that stage of your career. If you have a 10,000 person fan base and millions of spins on streaming services, you have a different set of needs. If you're going on a national tour, that's a different kind of need. And then if you want to go on a global tour and you're thinking about your opening acts and things like that, that's a different need. How do you create a, an environment around an artist for each of these steps in their career path that's going to help move them from one level to the other. And I, in the back of my mind, I, I can't help but think about how right now in the artist 3.0, in the music industry 3.0 world, that a lot of it is, you know, the big bad labels, you know, terrible, terrible bad labels, you know, they give an advance and they take all the money and, you know, you get shelved and nothing ever works out. But I think that we will probably end up on the other end of this with labels, and they already we're already seeing indications of this, modifying how they work with artists in, as a response to everything that's happening in the 3.0 world. And probably having what is a whole new crop of independent labels and companies that are quasi-label publisher management companies. And we're seeing that, a lot of that already. A, which a is tremendous the, amount. Yeah. Exactly. It's the new it's the new farm clubs. It's the new sub pops and epitaphs and whatnot that are going to be starting up a whole new farm club and where those artists go you know do they graduate to the major label maybe not you know maybe they maybe that's a parallel system and the the major labels end up being much more for pop just the very very top of the of the list i don't know or having a lot of their revenue also coming from doing label services for this wide variety and maybe not owning folks or then maybe having a whole different model i wanted to say that as well that just to talk about what you just said, where as an artist, you do, you have different needs if you have less than a thousand listens than when you have millions of listens and you're on a national tour or whatever. But you can pick and choose your team now. So you go with a team to start who gives you the best practices and the education that you need. When you're educated, then you go with someone who can really, whether it's a major label or a label services company, really leverage what you've built. It's really... Well, we're actually seeing and talking with people that there's um, the question gets to be when you're international is do you have that international network? And that is a benefit that some of the larger companies are going to have for a while is that they already have all of the international threads put together to be able to get the attention of people in country. And I'm definitely hearing that from various people in some of our conversations that now that international is much more translucent, that 
people can find your artists, you can find your fans, you can put things together, that there's an increasing amount of travel and touring internationally. And we have been seeing all sorts of pieces of the puzzle of China getting ready to be accelerating pretty dramatically. You now have to figure out how does my poor management team in whatever city I'm in have the relationships to be able to do an international tour and deliver it and make it all happen. And you may bring on um, different label service companies or whatever for short pockets of time. And that's your decision. And that's how you decide to spend and prioritize your budget. Might be good when you're in Germany to bring on someone that knows that market as opposed to the U.S., as opposed to your poor management team trying to figure out everything. It is interesting now because I talk, I talk to a lot of whether it's 40-year-old artists who are kind of going, I don't want to engage with my fans um, and I don't want to be having to tell them what I ate for breakfast and bring a 360 camera along to a rehearsal. I don't want to do that to the 20 year olds who think that's totally normal, but they don't see how they can be an artist and have the time for any of that and figuring out even sort of how they're negotiating the who in their own ecosystem is wanting and to take the time to manage all this stuff. It's sort of an interesting uh, conversation of what it means to be an artist and how visible you want or not want to be in this very connected, collaborative, recombining world. Oh. Right, exactly. I mean, how how do you have time to hone your craft if you're on, uh, you know, updating your social media and planning your tour and doing everything under the sun on the business and social side? You it takes time, effort, and and years, really, to develop skills in musicianship. If you're not working with a top shop or you're working with your best friend and think somehow they can manage you, there's a, and I'm finding more and more management companies who have a whole different level of professionalism and technology understanding and data understanding and working with a wide variety of companies. It's a really different world. I also am always amazed when um, an artist will come to us and say, oh my gosh, we just spent so many weeks in the recording studio and we spent so much budget and now, oh, sorry, I don't have any budget to promote my music. And it's this, all free now, isn't it? Yeah, and it, this goes back to what you were saying about 30,000 tracks a month being released and how do you get above the noise? It, you you have to invest. You have to find a way to invest and and this goes back to this conversation you've been having about, well, what are, what are what's the funding? Right, and I, I do feel like one of the things that I think was really great about the 1.0 and 2.0 world is that there were filters and there were gatekeepers who placed bets because a lot of it, a lot of it does come down to understanding an artist and the, the human ear and saying, you know, I want to make a bet on this one, this person instead of that person, because I, I feel something about their drive. I see potential people being really invested in that artist. And in the, this new world, uh, the artist can't really survive without having people that are invested in them. But how, you know, is it is that then the artist's responsibility to go and find everybody who can fill those needs? I think it's hard. I think it's really, really hard for an artist, especially someone who's on the younger side of things, to navigate what they need and how to vet their partners. Yeah. Well, this is part of a continued conversation. Let me thank you guys for joining us as we've had a conversation here about Music 3.0 and if you're looking to finance anybody in the Music 3.0 spot, let me know. No, um, there's a lot of interesting <laughs> things now. And we're actually in conversations, so we're following up in future episodes with people who are looking at the predictive analytics side of a lot of this and the interesting pieces of the puzzle of new finance companies that are coming to bear in looking at not just buying and repackaging existing rights, but actually trying to use this stuff as a crystal ball to move into the future. So thanks, guys. Can't wait for that. Yeah, yeah thanks. 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 Well, that wraps up this podcast. Many thanks to the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation for being our hosts of this ongoing series. You can subscribe to us in all the usual places, or you can come find us at innovation.schoolofmusic.ucla.edu. 
Join us again to follow the other adventures that we will be tracking down in innovating music. Thanks again.